Uh, so welcome to the um, Bicycle Pedestrian Subcommittee meeting. It is Wednesday, February 15th. We bumped it to today as opposed to last week. Um, so this is sort of an off week. And let's start off with public comment. Um, if there's anybody with public comment, happy to take that. If you want to raise your hand, either virtually or physically, that would be fine. Okay, I don't see any public comment. Um, so the next item up is um, downtown bike shelter options. We, <clears throat> at the January meeting, the committee talked about um, potentially getting a dual system where there are there's a section of uh, covered bike shelter that would be uh, double decker. So with um, uh, stacked bike storage next to just single loaded or um, ground um, um, storage, just um, straight in storage that could hold eight loops. So we went back to the vendor to get a quote on the double decker system. And I think I may have um, shared that um, with folks, but I'm gonna pull it up now, do a screen share um, of that document um, and show what the results <clears throat> or what the quote is for that. So this would be um, the Darrow system because it's been um, to date the least um, costly uh, system that we could install. And this would be for a 20, although they're still calling it a 12 foot, this would be 24 feet long. Um, and the total quote is $25,000. $25,844. We have a grant of $10,000. So that would mean there would have to be a um, fundraising effort of $16,000. Um, this does not include installation. So in fact, um, I guess I would backtrack a little bit and add um, some amount of money as well for um, installation because we don't have the capacity at this point to do in-house installation. So we'd have to um, move forward with um, contracting out installation for this unit. So the alternative was about $14,000 um, for just a double 24 foot wide um, bike shelter, but it didn't have the stacking. So you get about eight more bikes on the stacked system. Um, so, um, maybe six to eight bikes on the stacked system more than just, um, single loaded. So <clears throat> that's the quote. Um, let me stop my screen share here. And so the, uh, essentially there's a $12,000 fundraising difference between, um, a stacked system and a non-stacked system. Uh, let me just stop the screen share here. Why do I do this? Good. Um, are there any comments from anybody on the committee? Okay, so I don't see anybody, any questions from, hold on, let me just move this. Sorry, I'm trying to get rid of screen share. There we go. Um, <clears throat> okay, so no comments. Um, Elena, go ahead. Hi, good morning. Um, I had a, just one general question. Do we have quorum today and are decisions gonna be made? Yes, we have four people, four members. Okay, I just wasn't able to see everyone in the office to, to know whether or not. Oh, yep. and I guess Donna and Maggie are technically on the committee as well. Um, so Brett is here with me and then Maggie and Freeman. Got it. Um, so I guess a question I have, um, how many bikes does 
the cheaper um, alternative and the more expensive? Like what's the delta there in terms of bike storage? Um, and then my second question was around fundraising efforts and whether or not that's done for say parking spots um, for cars and you know the double standard for for cyclists to to get some sort of parking downtown and having to fundraise for that versus um I, I'm not super aware of any any sort of fundraising efforts as it relates to um <clears throat> car parking so I'm, I'm just curious um the the president that sets um for this project and then in future projects um sure i can answer that so the as i mentioned there are approximately six more parking spaces in this double decked um system than if you just got to side by side um the uh we got a a, a grant for ten thousand dollars for a bike shelter so that's the amount of money that we have the city's you know, went out to um, seek that funding. Um, to your point, no, we don't have fundraising for parking spots. Um, we have fundraising for a lot, most any other, you know, street furniture, um, open space acquisitions. There are a lot of different um, fundraising efforts that take place for different things in the community. And so clearly the delta between the grant that we received and the less expensive setup system, uh, setup was, you know, smaller, about four or $5,000. Um, but the committee uh, wanted to see what it would be to have sort of a stacked system. So that's what I'm bringing to the committee today. Go ahead, Brent. Uh, to Elena's point, I think it's a great question, you know, talking about who has to work hard for what, but the main point of this is covered bike right. shelter, not just parking. Right. So it is a little different in that regard. Um, Elena, I think you know that I, I, I support walking and biking pretty uh, pretty a lot, but um, it is a little different in that regard. Right. <clears throat> so the total, the total number of parking spaces in the larger system would be 18 to 20? Um, so the total would be a minimum um, 20. 20. Yeah. Um, it's I, the reason why I'm hesitating is because on different things. So the quote shows um, that the double the Darrow Decker has parking for 12 bikes, but on their spec sheets they say it's 14. Um, and then the single load is just you. It's just covering, so you it's however many loops you can fit in, and they've estimated eight. So um, there'd be a, you know, if we take the spec sheets, they say eight, if we're buying two units, essentially, two units single loaded, then that would be 16 spaces if we use their spec numbers. If we buy two units, but one of them is double loaded, it's, you know, 12 to 14 spaces versus eight in that one side of the, of the shelter. So at least 20, maybe 22. Yeah, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Alina, did you have another comment? Yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, I hate to put all of our eggs in one basket in terms of doubling down on the number of parking spots in one particular area in the city. And if fundraising efforts are gonna happen, I would be interested in exploring fundraising for a second bike shelter somewhere else in the city, um, simply because, you know, not everyone is going to be parking down where this location is. Um, it's not like super prominent for a lot of people, so they might not know about it. Um, maybe we fundraise for wayfinding signs so people know about the bike parking, um, but I'm hesitant to invest so much money in one singular sheltered bike parking. Um, without like exploring the option of having two shelters and that could be a longer term fundraising effort. Um, and then I'm also just conscious of 
e-bikes and the increased popularity of them and the weight that they carry and whether or not the double decker configuration would be able to handle that and um if it's just not it, it might be like a little short-sighted to invest so much money in this double decker system when the the way bicycles are being built today with batteries are much heavier and clunkier and might not be suited for the double decker um, parking arrangements that are proposed in the larger structure. Yeah, so if we went with a single, it would definitely be closer to that $10,000 um, grant line item, and then you'd be fundraising for a second one, um, which would be less than fundraising for the total with the double decker setup. So um, it's just a, you know, if the committee wants to think about two separate locations, I mean, the other thing that we need to talk about is where these would be. Um, and thinking about two distinct locations, we are going around measuring uh, different locations. So there are a couple places in Pulaski Park, um, one at the back of the park, which would accommodate a 24 foot long um, section or at the front of the park opposite the um, bus shelter. Um, and certainly if we were to split that in half and just do a single loaded shelter, it takes up less space. And so if you're thinking about the context of Pulaski Park, it would take up um, um, just visually, obviously it would take up less space if you're doing a single one. And then the other location potentially that we looked at that's um, public layout is actually between the parking garage and the Northampton Brewery. So there's already concrete pad there. That's the other sort of um, uh, part of the equation that we need to think about is um, in order to keep the cost down, making sure that there's existing um, solid surface that this can be installed on. So if we were to think about splitting it, it might make sense to have something sort of down mid mid Main Street. I don't know. I mean, it would be off Main Street, but it also is close to the bike path um, in that location behind the parking garage. Um, so those are just some other um, things that the committee should think about as well as we move forward in selecting whatever option the committee thinks is most appropriate. Um, Barbara, did you have a comment? Yes, hi, this is Barbara Bricker. I live on Meadow Street. This is my second chance to look at your meeting, to see your meeting. And so I heard a little bit about the um, this yeah, the, at the last meeting, which I think is fabulous. I, I just, in philosophically, I think, whatever you do, you should do the very best job. So I would say, do go ahead and choose this location. It's a reasonably good location and do it double decker and do it the best way you can. I think it starts as an example for what really can be done. I think short changed, it's short changed to do a smaller one that's not gonna be the capacity. And so that's my comment about that. And then I'm seeing, I heard, at that last meeting that lots of us Smith students would be using this. That's a great location for Smith students to get the bus. And I just think Smith is loaded with money and we should ask them to help. That's it. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other comments from the committee, Freeman? Yeah, I've been thinking about this because I, I don't really understand, you know, I was I missed that meeting in January where there's there was a discussion. I'm not I don't understand how um usage was identified, you know, the, the need and the it was was identified and who actually this would be serving. Um so that's one question. Um 
with regard to what what Barbara just said, I was also thinking about. Um, you know, I grew up on Long Island, and um, when I was born uh, and when I was young, there was uh, one highway going into the city. Um, and my father had a business in the city, and I would on the weekends go in with him. And then at one point, the Long Island Expressway was built. <laughs> and when we first used to drive on that on the expressway at uh, five in the morning to get into his business on the weekend, there would be nobody on the road. And, um, and now, if anybody's familiar with the Long Island Expressway now, there's virtually no time of day when that would even be close to the, the case. And I guess the reason I mentioned that is because I think if we want to change the culture of, of uh, moving about the city, um, you know, we really need to do things like this to have a, a, a bike shelter. But what's the best way to do it? Um, and what are the other things that also go along with that? You know, I think that's, you know, obviously a much more complex issue. I don't necessarily feel that we need to have a, a double decker one, but I don't have any information. You know, I don't really understand what the what the need how the need was identified. Um, and with regard to funding, I I think, you know, looking to the public to raise funds makes a lot of sense. And of course, you know, I think organizations like FNT could help with with uh you know doing that that initiative um so i i don't know if somebody can if you can help me understand what the how the need was identified and i'm sorry to go over this if it's already been covered yeah i can explain that i wouldn't necessarily say it's a need i would say it's a desire and so from that perspective um you know i'm not sure that that means it's the best solution I think there was a conversation about wanting to understand better what the costs would be if we went to a two-tiered or at least divide the total bike storage area into two and one side would um, have um, the capacity to have double um, storage uh, to increase storage and accommodate people who don't have um, you know, um, issues with lifting bikes, lighter bikes up onto a second tier, and it might then increase the capacity without increasing the footprint. So it was really more a request for, ex, you know, exploring the cost and then making a determination whether or not that was an appropriate path to take. So uh, no decision has been made and no, I don't think any value has been placed on, you know, which one would be better. Um, I would disagree. And I think I've heard multiple times that covered bike parking is a need in the city. Um, and I, I mean, I think, I think what Lena was getting at earlier is that this is a need and we shouldn't be um, just saying it's a want uh, because bikes aren't the same as cars and they have exposed drivetrains in most cases and, uh, and things like that. So it, it does make a difference to have covered parking. And I think that is an equity standpoint. Um, however, what I'm not clear on is what's best in terms of like, we say Pulaski parking, Carolyn, you were saying there's there's a front location, which is smaller and a back location, which is larger. So I'd like to hear from people because I haven't made up my mind. If I had to decide on a smaller system up front that was really visible, would be single tiered or a larger system in back, which could be double tiered or couldn't or, or, or could be single but larger. Uh, which I would go for in, you know, the smaller one up front would be smaller but it would be visible and it would if we fundraise for it anyway then we would be fundraising for a second spot simultaneously and splitting our eggs as elena said or we could go big and do it great like barbara was saying but it would be in the back of the park less visible 
but way more storage. I don't know. Um, well, I can go to the first of all, I just want to correct um, and clarify. I wasn't saying there was not a need for shelter. Sure. I was saying there's not there wasn't determined to be a need for a stacked double decker shelter. So that um, I think all along the reason why we um, sought the grant was because we were trying to address that desire and need for covered bike storage. Um, so I can show the um, pictures of Pulaski Park. Um, and um, let me just go, just open this up. I don't know, can you see that um, image? Um, that's at the back of the yes. park. So this um, this area here is 24 feet um, wide. The only problem is that um, if we were, we, you know, it, it would interfere here with this area where I think there was a tree. So we might um, actually as a 20, as a shorter bike shelter, this might fit better. I'm just going to go to another image. Um, let's go to the, okay. Um, <clears throat> So can did people see the change in image? Yep. yep. Okay. So this is the area, um, and so it might if it's a if it's just a one st um, one stall system or a one you know um, unit might be able to put it in an area that still allows pedestrian passage. The problem with this is that it would. Um, shrink the uh, pedestrian through access here. And so we might need to pay, um, put a concrete in this area to fill this gap to make a continuous walkway along there. So that's the, so that's not necessarily a slam dunk, but that's potential for an option. It's also at the top of the uh, ramp that comes up from the bike path. Um, so let me just pull up another image of the front. Um, okay. So do you see this by the trash barrels? Yep. Okay. So this is the other space where 24 feet could be located. So the bike, the bus shelter is right over here and you can see the valley bikes there. So in some sense, it makes sense. There's a the kiosk here, the um, repair kiosk and all the other bike share is there and then the bus shelter is there. So in some sense, it, it um, is kind of um, beneficial to have everything clustered there. Um, this, the bigger the, it is here, the more obtrusive, I guess I would say it becomes, but the, um, let me just see if I have another image of the, of that location. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. Just, I guess I just have that one shot. So, um, at, at, at any rate, there 24 feet could fit in this dimension, but again, it sort of comes closer to the front sidewalk. So, um, and then the, uh, so, you know, I don't know if people feel one way or the other about the location. Elena, did you have a question or a comment? Yeah, I was just gonna look I'm pulling up Pulaski Park on my computer, but um, there, there's a pretty substantial bike rack that's not sheltered. If you're like crossing yep. Main Street, going into Pulaski, turning yep. left, there's a bike rack and turning right is the bus stop. Right. Um, and I'm not against adding more bike parking downtown because I think there's absolutely a need. But a question here is like, could we just build a shelter over existing bike racks that are there? Yeah, the only complication about that part is that that's um, those bike racks are buried under trap rock gravel. And so it's not a solid enough surface to plant the shelter on. So we'd have to pour a pad. So that is um, an alternative, but then it adds to the um, 
the work and the expense in that location. So we were trying to find initially find a location that already had a solid surface so that we would just be bolting into the existing surface. This might be a, a maybe I'm not understanding, but maybe we just don't buy new bike racks and just put the $10,000 grant. And I don't know if we can do this towards putting down a surface and building a shelter over the existing bike racks that are already there. Uh, no, this grant is for the shelter. For the shelter, but not say the bike racks. Maybe um, I'm being clear. Like we already have bike racks there. So there's no need to go out and buy additional bike racks. We would just need to pay for a shelter to be built over the existing bike racks. Oh yeah, this, um, so the idea was to purchase a shelter. We're assuming that we're gonna, whatever system, unless we buy the double decker that comes with the um, the bike um, holders. I mean, the whole system of, you know, raising and lowering the bikes, it's whatever loops we have that would fit under a shelter. So we're just buying the shelter gotcha. with the funding. Um, so no, the plan wasn't to go out and buy, I mean, we also have extra loops around anyway, but certainly if we were going to, we would reuse any ones that we needed to, we're not going to throw any away. But to Elena's point, it would not be feasible to put the shelter over the trap rock because the shelter needs to be bolted down. Yes. Right. Not just the bike racks, but the shelter needs to be bolted down. The shelter, the bike racks aren't currently bolted. Okay. They're sort of buried. Sure. So yes, it's the posts that have to yep. be bolted. Okay, just wanted to be clarified. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So. Yeah, go ahead, Freeman. So um, what's the opportunity to, or the, the challenge of moving a shelter once it's in place? Is it a very expensive and destructive process? Um, I don't know what very expensive means. <laughs> and Donna might know better about um, these kinds of costs, but they're, they're, um, it's sort of like expensive Legos is the way I look at it as like, you can take them apart and they ship them. You can, you put them together and you bolt it. So I guess from that perspective, it's like any other furniture that gets bolted down. Um, that sure you can unbolt them and rebolt them. And the reason I ask that is because I'm thinking that having a, a a unit in a place that's more visible um would kind of um help to create you know more recognition about what's possible and, and support the idea. And if at some point in the future it was decided that you know, and, and I'm thinking of a single unit it, that that we'd want to have another unit uh, either in a different location or in the back of Pulaski Park. That 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 could be an option. Is that is that does that sound right? If that's possible. Sure. I mean, so and maybe to that to your point, the maybe we should just focus on getting a single unit at this point. See how it's used see um, you know whether it makes sense in that location and then move forward from there um, opting to buy a second shelter for a different location um, based on demand and interest. Carolyn, when you, I assume that it's generally the planning department who's uh, planning sustainability who's who's seeking these grants and getting these grants so maybe you would know best would, high usage of these facilities demonstrate to grant givers in the future that we have a, a need for more yeah. shelters and, sure. and and therefore make it easier to get grants in the future sure yeah i mean the word the a on the flip side is true like <laughs> we wouldn't want to go out to the funders and say hey we need another shelter the first one didn't really work out so well but we want another one <laughs> <laughs> um so uh, um, does it sound like there's interest in uh, Pulaski Park and maybe a single unit? I think I'm leaning in that direction. 
Okay. Yeah, I think there's no wrong answer here, but I'm leaning in that direction as well. And to to keep it feasible, to keep it momentum going, and assuming we don't stop work on this on this need, which is a larger than you know uh, twelve spaces or whatever we're providing, even in the smaller, uh, you know, there, as long as we keep moving it forward, then I think it's better to go with something that's going to be successful and placed best. Uh, you know, Barbara was saying, do it the best you can. Well, I think best you can may in this case be slightly smaller, but more visible. I'm not sure. Okay. Well, I'll circle back. I'll also see if I can, um, you know, we'll hone in on the precise quote and there still may be a need to um, find some money, but it'll be much reduced and we might have it in traffic mitigation or something like that, that we can cover the gap if it's small enough. Um, so I guess we'll leave it at that. Um, and um, that's, I mean, all of this has been very helpful and beneficial. So I appreciate it. Um, Carolyn, can I ask one other question related sure. to this? Um, when the, when the, uh, Main Street redesign happens. Is, is there any opportunity to build in uh, or to include the kind of um, you know, um, infrastructure that would support that? You know, to have another. It, could that be something? Another bike rack? Could that be something that was supported? So if we moved the one that we might place in the in the front of Pulaski Park to the back. Would it then be possible to include in that project, you know, another rack, or is that, you know, just not wouldn't be applicable or appropriate? Um, you know, I think, I guess the way I would look at it is is more about the timing and when we might add a new um, facility might be at the same time that we do a ribbon cutting for the opening, the reopening of Main Street. But the picture Main Street has very defined boundaries um, and what will happen within those boundaries. So we can't add on stuff that's paid for through the TIP process that's not part of that project. So. Got it. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Um, so let's move on to the next agenda item. I think. Um, is DPW. Um, Donna or Maggie, do you have any traffic calming updates? Yep, good morning. I, I just want to talk a little bit about the high school um, and, and our efforts at the high school. So um, the, the mayor um, has really prioritized the whole Route 9 corridor uh, through the high school area. Um, as well as the surrounding streets, um, Elm and, and down onto Milton, Milton and, and through that intersection. Um, it is kind of our brightest burning uh, priority at this point. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about what our efforts are and, and just kind of, you know, let as many folks as I can know sort of what the timeframes are and what we can and cannot do. Um, I, I know that Pardon me, there, there was another incident um, with a, a car and a pedestrian um, just recently, you know, within the last week. And, and of course, as these incidents continue, um, you know, I think uh, folks continue to pay attention to the area and, and ask that, that the city, um, you know, move quickly. Um, so uh, we are working with um, our design firm to get a proposal for the design of the improvements that I described at the last TPC meeting. So at January's TPC meeting, I talked about um, corridor improvements that, that were part of their study uh, of the area. So um, that would be traffic signals um, and, and bump outs, uh, parking restrictions, um, and then a realignment of that intersection at, at Milton and Riverside, as well as the imposition of, of one-way traffic flow and, and bike lanes on Milton Street. Um, so, so that was the kind of the executive summary of the, the recommendations within the report. 
Um, so I am waiting on our design firm for a, an actual design. You know, what, what we had was sort of a conceptual plan, like these are the things we think you should do. Um, and now we actually have to have someone design this, like where is the power coming from? And, you know, where is the mast arm going to go for the traffic signal and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, just pulling a proposal like that together is a fairly significant level of effort. So um, we've had a back and forth with our design firm, um, including a, a, a fairly lengthy call yesterday to just sort of define our limits of work and what exactly we're looking for. And I've made it very clear to the design firm that, you know, we are looking for, um, you know, there's sort of the same old stuff, which is like a traffic signal. Um, and then there's, um, you know, more kind of newer traffic coming ideas that can be implemented on top of maybe a sort of, you know, the usual stuff like um, a traffic signal. Um, so, you know, one of the things we want to look at is, is um, you know, tabling up intersections, um, raising crosswalks, um, you know, really shrinking the travel lanes um, to certainly provide, um, you know, tell everybody like, hey, this is a really, you know, shrunk down travel area and everybody needs to exercise a little bit more caution through here. So that's one of the things that that I've really stressed to our designers is, you know, where, I, I mean, sure, like there's only so much we can do to control traffic on the street, but we're, we're looking, you know, for, um, you know, as much as we can possibly sort of cram into this area. It's, it, I mean, this is a corridor project. There's no question about it. And it's, 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 in such a big area, it's, it's almost a tip style project um, that's not going to be on the tip, that, that's going to be funded by the city. So this is really where all of our resources are focused at this point. Um, there will be ordinances on the council agenda tomorrow um, for the imposition of school zones at Smith Oak and at, at the high school. We've applied for um, grants through MassDOT um, and hope to be awarded the, the actual flashing school zone signs that, that um, you know, would, would notify motorists that the speed limit drops while school is in session. Um, and then there's a speed feedback sign that let's say, you know, your speed is whatever, 30 or 25 or 40 or whatever it is. Um, so those ordinances will, will start moving through the council process, having come out of TPC, as well as the permanent parking restriction on the, the park side, on the child's park side, um, to, to eliminate the, the temporary no parking zone and make that permanent. Um, we'll obviously have to fold in the school zone, the imposition of a school zone into the larger project. Um, so again, that's something that, that we've also discussed with, with the design firm. So, it, you know, just to get a proposal and a price from them, um, you know, is definitely a, a, a level of effort. And we want to make sure that we're negotiating the best possible price for design services. But generally, if this is a design uh, contract is you know, 10 to 12% of construction costs. And as, as we know, the construction costs are, are approaching $3 million. Um, so, you know, we're, we're looking at a very significant uh, uh, cash outlay here. And um, if, if you're not aware, um, if, if members aren't aware, um, there is an appropriation of half a million dollars that went through council um, recently. Um, so I do have the money to sign the contract, which will at least get us going. But you know, we're looking at a 12-month design process. Um, so it's it's not something that's gonna turn around quickly. So um, so anyway, I, it, that's sort of a long-winded explanation of what's going on at the high school, but we are truly moving as fast as we possibly can, but there's a lot of challenges around this. I, I see I, I see your going up going on. If someone from the committee wants to go first. Go ahead. Uh, I would just say thank you, Donna, for especially for pushing for the speed tables and the all, all the things that are, uh, you know, data driven to calm traffic beyond just the big old old style uh, 
traffic signals and redesigns of the roadway. Um, I think that's exactly what I heard from the meeting, the TPC meeting. It was long. I heard a lot of comments. I was there. Um, that's that's what was supported. Thank you for following through on that. And, you know, Barbara said earlier, when you do something, do it well, do it right. And I, I, I think that that's exactly what you should do here in this case. And I, I appreciate your work. Thank you. I think that's more important than even the speed of the project, which obviously is a big thing. I don't want anybody to get killed, but in the long run, I want the best project. So thanks. Yeah, and, and one of the things we do have to be careful of is because this is, I mean, you know, there's, there's, we have to look at utilities. I mean, you, you don't just, uh, you know, land traffic signals on top of something without looking at, okay, what's the condition of the drainage? You know, what's the condition of, you know, what do we got under the ground here? What do the sidewalks look like? Um, you know, and that's one of the reasons it's good to talk about this at TPC because we want to hear, you know, feedback from everyone and say, okay, well, you know, what should we be focused on? What have we potentially um, missed? You know, what what can folks bring to us that we might not otherwise have uh, paid attention to here? Um, it, you know, at the end of the day, we want to get something done, but we do need to be careful to not turn this into such a project that we've sort of priced ourselves out of being able to do something you know so so what it, the other thing that we want to look at is when we bid this we might have to bid the job in sections you know um i'm sure folks have noticed the price of everything going up um sometimes doubling we see things tripling um it, you know for for various things that we buy so you know what we may end up doing when we bid this is sort of bidding the project in stages um and seeing what the unit prices come back as and and then look at our available budget and say okay what what can we reasonably implement here um but when they design mm -hmm. this we want them to give us a lot of options um to, to your point right so thank you Elena? Yeah, just to echo Brett's comments, thank you. This is really exciting um, and really exciting to see the additional feedback incorporated into the plans. Um, I just had two questions. One is a clarifying one and the other is more general. I guess the clarifying point is, so it's been decided more or less that signals are going to be implemented and move forward with that particular plan. Okay. And then the second one is, so it seems like it's a 12 month project um, and can totally, there's lots of things that I'm not even aware of utilities and everything that you mentioned. Um, but I guess a question is what's happening between now and the 12 months? Um, like, are there going to be, um, are those lanes going to be narrowed? Um, with using paint or cones, or are there going to be any sort of speed bumps um, implemented in that area? Because, because as you said, people continue to get hit uh, by vehicles, and so what's what's the stopgap between now and when the the project is able to to actually be implemented? I think that, that there's a few things that I can, there's a few ways I can answer that question. I mean, PD has definitely increased their enforcement in the area to the extent possible. Um, they have their speed feedback sign um, just below Cooley Dickinson, you know, on a, one of those digital uh, speed feedback signs just to try to encourage people to be mindful of, of the speed at which they're traveling. Um, you know, but they have limited resources. So with that said, there's a couple of things that DPW can do. I mean, the first is I'd like to get this permanent parking restriction through council and, and make that official on the park side. So at least we've sort of opened that area up and, and we've got site. Um, and, and then the school zone in position, I think is going to make a difference because if we can get that through council, and then sign that up and then work with the police to enforce that, that actually legally drops the speed limit through that entire corridor um, to 20 miles an hour. Um, and, and that I think is gonna be a game changer um, just in terms of, of kind of controlling vehicle flow. Um, I also, um, it, it, I'm going to be working with the mayor and the school superintendent. You know, I think there needs to be some level of awareness 
um, on the part of pedestrians about sort of stepping into crosswalks while distracted or heeding the, um, the crossing guards who are in position. And some of the incidents that we have had, and certainly the most recent incident we had, um, was, um, it, you know, not uh, necessarily the fault of, of the motor vehicle operator. Um, and and I think that everyone needs to be more mindful um, of potential, um, you know, car versus pedestrian or car versus bicycle um, uh, conflicts. Um, so I think there's some level of public awareness, um, you know, sort of public information that can be disseminated from the school, um, you know, to make folks more mindful of like there is a shared responsibility when 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 you're stepping into the roadway. Um, and and I think that if everyone can be a little bit more aware, I think that that would be that would go a long way. Um, in terms of what I can do with um, you know cones or paint, um, it's bumps in this corridor. It's too heavily traveled. We have you know tractor trailer traffic. It, it, you know tens of thousands of daily vehicles. It, it is not an appropriate place for temporary speed humps, which are designed for use in like a parking lot. Um, it, it's just a total no go from from a traffic flow and safety standpoint. Um, you know, it's winter. I have to worry about de-icing operations right now. So there, there's nothing I can put in the middle of the road right now. I'm also very mindful that this is a crowded corridor. So if I start putting cones out, if I start putting barriers out, you know, I'm adding congestion to an already congested area. So we need to be very careful what we could potentially put here. One of the things we could look at is try to do some temporary striping as part of our line striping contract um, this summer. And if if that works, um, I, I'm, I'm certainly, you know, if the timing works, I'm certainly not averse to spending money on something that would be very temporary. It would obviously be all torn out. Um, so from a budgetary standpoint, I would want to make sure it makes fiscal sense um, if, for the city to do that. But in terms of putting physical things in the middle of the road, I'm, I'm sort of limited in, in what I can do. Yeah, that makes total sense. I think, you know, it's exciting to hear that there's going to be hopefully a school zone there and the, the feedback sign also slowing drivers down. I would say, you know, I think we, the research shows that speed limit signs don't actually slow drivers down. It's really the design of the streets. And so I'm, I'm hesitant to say that those, those things that are going to be implemented between now and when the project is implemented are going to actually slow drivers down. And so um, just to say that if there are anything, like whether it's paint or cones, um, I think people just, or even like a construction sign that says, you know, something about this is a really dangerous intersection um, that we should think of, we, we, have, we have to do something like people are getting hit on a weekly basis. And, um, you know, I, I don't have the solutions because I know there's a lot of constraints. Um, you know, I totally respect that it's a heavily traffic corridor, um, but there has to be something that we can slow traffic down. And I think um, totally here on, it's a two-sided situation where pedestrians have a responsibility as much as cars, but um, pedestrians aren't in, um, aren't moving a lethal weapon. Um, so um, I really would, you know, there's, I mean, there's just, I guess I'm, with all due respect, not satisfied with that answer. Like there has to be something that we can do to really make this intersection safer for people, um, aside from just putting and posting new speed limits, just because the research shows that that doesn't actually slow car traffic down. Yeah, and, and I certainly get that you're, you know, like everyone says to us, you know, do something, do something, you know, <laughs> and I get that, and I get the sense of urgency, and I get the frustration, and then there's an incident, you know, the incident that happened last week is because, you know, someone crossed while distracted, did not heed the crossing guard telling them to stop, and, you know, fell down in the crosswalk um, because they were surprised by a bus that was approaching. 
um, you know, that is an example of, of something that it was completely preventable um, and, and avoidable um, and, and not a situation where some manipulation of the physical layout of the road could have prevented yes. that. That is straight out human error. Um, and it's certainly an unfortunate situation and we're very sympathetic to it. And there have been other uh, events there um, you know, that were not caused by something like this, you know, so certainly the totality of the situation suggests that, that we do need to do something. I'm very limited in what I can do right now. It's February, you know, I have to, I, I have to be sort of focused on not having things in the street so I can be ice if I need to. Um, you know, in, in the spring, we can certainly look at, you know, putting in barriers like we do downtown and trying to shrink you know, crossing distances, but I also have to be really mindful. There's a lot of visual clutter in that area. And then you crowd people in on top of that. And, and we don't want to take a situation which is sort of inherently crowded and make it uh, worse, if, if you will. Um, so I, I think that in a couple of months, we can take a look at the area. You know, the chief and I will probably um, you know, see if we can think about what sort of efforts between her department and mine that we could make, um, you know, once the school zone is implemented, um, as far as enforcement goes, and then can we put a physical thing in the road that, that will make this safer, but we will only put a physical thing in the road if we're certain it's going to make it safer. You know, I don't, I don't want to put a concrete barrier in the road and then someone drives into it. Um, and that's the So, Thanks, Carol, and I'm I'm actually double booked this morning, and I have, okay. and, and I'm sorry to cut the conversation short, but um, I I uh, it's timely for my next commitment here. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next month. Yeah. Um, so the only other thing on the agenda is meeting times. I don't have minutes from January, and I don't know that it makes sense with just the limited folks here to um, necessarily um, go into a lot of detail about this, but it was raised at one of the last meetings about whether we could talk about adjusting the time. Um, I don't think so much the date, maybe, but um, that certainly can be on the table. Um, I don't know if anybody briefly um uh freeman or maggie if you um or brett <laughs> if you um had any comments about the time or um interest in altering that and then we could just put that forward on the next agenda this time and, and wednesday is work for me it's fine in the morning okay Um, I was I was uh, heartened. Uh, I'm sorry to say, Brett, um, when the time was changed from what it had previously been uh, from seven in the morning to nine. Um, so, you know, for me, this time works, but also later in the day could also work um, if that would be helpful for members. Uh, earlier would be less attractive to me. <laughs> Okay. I'm not opposed. I, I'm pretty flexible, especially on Wednesdays. Uh, I think this was mainly Nick's issue, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure. I forget about James or Michael who aren't here. Yeah. So I guess we should talk about it next month. Okay. But um, it's not urgent for me. Okay. okay. I, I mean, I'd like to make it work for as many people as possible. Right. But other than that, I have no particular agenda. Okay. All right, well, that's all I got. Thank you all, appreciate it. And Thank enjoy you. the rest of the month. Thanks for coming, Barbara and Elena.